So it's a great pleasure to talk about this extraordinary painting, and particularly at the School of Traditional Art. Um, it's something that I've been familiar with for many years and have loved for many years. And I have to attribute, as um, Emma mentioned, that I studied with the sinologists Claude Lahr and Elizabeth Rochard de la Vallée. And there, they have really imparted their knowledge to me about this particular painting. So I'm very much indebted to, to them and to the memory of my teacher, Claude Lahr, who was an extraordinary French sinologist. Um, so my, my main aim this evening is to really just familiarize you with this extraordinary painting. And I'm, maybe some of you are familiar with it already, I don't know. There are many different ways of looking at it, and there are, there are a few things that have been written about the possible meanings. And, and I was reading something the other day by a professor who's now no longer with us called Michael Lowe, who is a professor of Chinese at Oxford University. And he said, the problem with some scholarship is that, especially, I think, you no, know, he wasn't just talking about Western scholarship, he was talking about modern scholarship, is that we tend to sort of have a rather wanting to make some sort of exact either or decisions about things. And he said, particularly with this time in classical, in the classical Chinese tradition, things were always much more malleable. They were, it's not an either or thing, it's, it's very much inclusive. So as we go through this painting, and it is really um, an exploration of the journey of the, not just the soul, it's actually the souls after, after death. And um, there are many different ways of interpreting this. And of course, I will be bringing partly my own interpretation, but and also that of my, of my teachers. Um, so I, you have this information on the handout I think I gave you, and I don't want to go into any of the, of the details of how this painting was found. As Emma said, it's a painting from the second century BCE and when it was discovered, it was considered to be the earliest painting that existed on silk in the Chinese tradition, because usually silk doesn't last very long. The extraordinary thing about this tomb is that um, the, the central part of the tomb um, was, comp was incredibly well preserved. And um, they've discovered that it was lined with layers of, of chalk and carbon and various things to keep it very it was kind of really padded and made very intact so it was ex quite extraordinary when um, this discovery was made it was it was opened in 1972 and um, as the, the last little bit here says and it's also on your handout that the the body of a woman that was found inside the tomb was still soft and it was considered to be an extraordinary find at the time that um, because it gave such an amazing um, insight into um, the history and what was happening in, in the second century BCE. Um, the other thing that was very important that there were lots of texts found in the tomb. And this, for example, is a copy of the, the, Dao, the Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, or the, the way and its power, its, its um, virtue. Um, and at the time, it was really a big breakthrough in Sinology because it was the earliest existing text of the Tao Te Ching. Since then, a couple of others have been found that were even possibly earlier. And it, tr it really was a big leap forward in um, Sinology at the time and the, the translation of certain texts because it gave a very interesting, um, slightly new um, slant on how the text actually existed at that time, which has, which has been, um, gave a, a really boost, I would say, to, particularly at that time to um, the Sinology in the West. I've just mentioned the th there's three texts here that I'll be occasionally quoting from. And the Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, is a, considered to be a fifth century text, BCE. The Chu Si, or the Souls of Chu, come it was a little bit unsure, but they were sort of collated from texts that were written between the 4th and 2nd century. So a collection of songs and poems that come from a similar area of China that the tomb was excavated. So these are considered to be quite um, 
interesting in translating some of the imagery. And then a really interesting text called The Financer from the second century BCE, which um, is also very interesting to look um, at the same time as, as interpreting the, the banner, because it's, again, it it's has the, um, some of the stories and myths and cosmologies of that time. One of the very interesting things that was found in the tomb with this woman, it was the body of a woman that was found in the tomb, was this, this is a kind of reproduction, but it, it was an extraordinary um, picture of people doing qigong type exercises for health. And there was a lot of health manuals as well. And um, the various texts that were found in the tomb have led uh, people to believe that this woman was a kind of Taoist adept. She was very into health and longevity practices. And also she, the texts that she had with her kind of expressed a very deep um, interest in Taoism. This is um, the outer casing of the coffin that was that she, this woman was found in, and it was decorated with the most extraordinary intricate patterns. This is a pattern of a dragon and a tiger kind of um, fighting, but and it's very typical of the kind of um, coiling kind of amorphous shapes that were um, very common in decoration at this time, and. Um, the dragons and tigers figure quite large, both in the kind of coffin casings, but also in the banner itself. And there's also this idea of the sort of swirling patterns of, that are considered to be chi or vital energy sort of swirling around, which again um, we see in the, in the banner itself as well. This is the second, there, there were three different coffin casings and this is the second in the middle one. And this is just a close-up of some of that with these strange little figures who are kind of almost like riding, they're almost like skiing on these, or windsurfing or something on these currents, which is quite extraordinary. It's quite light-hearted and it's quite funny, some of the imagery, which is really interesting. So the banner itself um, was laid over the innermost coffin and the innermost coffin was really interesting. These outer two were very intricately painted and, and um, lacquered. And then the innermost coffin was covered with sort of animal hair and feathers, which is quite strange. Possibly gives an idea of some kind of shamanic thing happening, but no one really seems to have talked much about that. But um, when the funeral, the funeral, the banner itself was laid over this innermost coffin, and um, it was quite a common, others have been found, it's quite similar. This is considered to be the finest and certainly the most intact. There are others that have been found, but are much less um, preserved, well preserved. And also it's quite similar to some of the paintings that have been found on the walls of various tombs from, from around this time. So some of the imagery is quite um, common. And the banner is considered to act as a kind of map. It's, it was laid over the tomb and it was almost like a map as a guide for her soul or her souls to kind of help them on their journey after death. And on, on the top of the banner was placed a jade disc. And these discs are quite commonly found, particularly in tombs, and you'll probably be familiar with them from various museums. Um, the the um, British Museum has quite a lot in their Chinese collections. And this one, this picture I actually took in the Musée Guimet, which is a very beautiful one. And this, they're quite large. They were, this one was about this sort of size. And they're very often laid either on top of the body or on top of the coffin. And they're usually called the disc of heaven. It's, they're always made of jade and the patternings in the jade are, are considered to be very important. So, the banner itself. Um, the most important thing that you immediately notice with the banner is that there's 
quite a lot of dragons, which of course is a very common symbol in China and particularly at this time. And there are two dragons in the lower part of the, of the, of the banner and two in the upper part of the banner. And the two dragons in the lower part of the banner are entwined together through this central part of the banner, which we'll look at more closely, through one of these jade bee discs, the, the circle in the center there, where the, the dragons are kind of meeting, um, is considered to be one of the, a replica of these, one of these jade bee discs. And the two dragons in the upper part are separate. And we'll talk quite a bit about that because it's this intertwining of the dragons and then their separation, which is quite important. So there's three things that I want to really concentrate on as we go through, because there's so many things that could be spoken about with this banner. There's, it's got so much detail, but I want to look at the dragons and they're really at this time considered to be the kind of intermediaries between heaven and earth, the intermediary, intermediaries between the chi of heaven and the chi of earth. So the kind of life force and yin and yang, which also are representing heaven and earth. And we always see pairs of dragons and they're nearly always representing a yin and a yang dragon. And it, which is at, at this time, yin and yang was really representative of the change and the movement between heaven and earth, the different way that things function between heaven and earth. And then there's this concept of the hun and the po, which are, could be called the heavenly and the earthly souls and, or the yin and yang souls. And they combine in life. It's that it's the combination of this yin and yang soul, which creates a human life. And in death, they need to separate and they need to separate correctly for the death to be to, for the death to be a correct kind of death. And this is just a little quote from the souls of Chu, which says the journey after death above all the way to the door of lightning and below all the way to the great abyss. And this is the sort of journey that the banner takes. So this is the lower part of, of the, of the banner, which has these two dragons. The red dragon is considered to be a yang dragon, the pale whitey blue, a yin dragon. And in the center, they meet in, in the disc. And as I said, human life is made of the meeting of a yin, of yin and yang souls, which here in this sort of diagram are represented by this meeting of the yin and yang dragon, which are the forces, the life force, as it were. And directly below, You can see that streaming from the point where the dragons are meeting, where they're actually coming together through this heavenly disc, there's a stream. And this is considered to be like the stream of the life force coming from the meeting of the yin and the yang, and or the heaven and earth. And when we talk about yin and yang, we always have to think about heaven and earth at the same time. The forces of heaven and the forces of earth, as it were. And also just remembering this um, verse, very well-known verse from the Tao Te Ching, the Lao Tzu chapter 42, which is the Tao gives birth to one, one gives birth to two, two gives birth to three, and three gives birth to the 10,000 things. So this streaming is kind of representing the 10,000 things. The 10,000 things lean on the yin and embrace the yang and their powerful blending of chi makes harmony. Now this intermingling and blending of yin and yang is a very ancient concept in, in Chinese culture. And it's often um, shown by these two figures, Fuxi and Nu Gua, who are considered to be the kind of progenitors of human, of humanity really. And 
it's interesting because here um, they're holding the compass and the square. And uh, they're depicted in many different... This is actually um, an image from the Dunhuang Caves. And um, it's, it, this is a replica. And there are actually originals of, of these images in the National Museum in, in New Delhi, which I've seen. And they're, they're really huge. They're really interesting. They're really huge images. And they were probably made in about the 7th century, so, so later. But this idea of this intertwining of a kind of serpent tail, it was very um, common to, to, to show these sort of immortal beings, as it were. And a quote from the Hoinansa, which, as I said, was the text that was written around this same time. We have, in ancient times when heaven and earth did not yet exist, there was image without form. Dark, obscure, formless, soundless, fathomless and profound. No one knows its gait. Two spirits merged into life to regulate heaven and organize earth. And these are these two spirits, Fushi and Nugua, and they regulate heaven, which is a circle, and they organize earth, which is a square, with their compass and square. And this is another very common image of Fushi and Nugua um, holding their compass and square. This is a stone rubbing from around the second century BC. Whoops. So I was just wanting to show that this idea of this intertwining and coiling is a very common image to show a kind of generation of life. And directly below this sort of knot of life with the 10,000 things or beings trailing from, from that. There's the image, sorry, I'm just going the wrong way. There's the interesting image of a banquet. And it's below what's usually called a huang, and it's a, a stone, um, not sure what you'd call it. It's like a stone instrument that's struck and it's very often struck in, at funerals. It's a large, it's a, sometimes called a lithophone, I think. It's a stone instrument that can be struck and it makes a sonorous noise. And it was a very common um, thing to be used at funerals. And the interesting thing here is that sitting down below um, this huang, there's um, seven figures plus the figure at the side, which is considered to be the woman herself, enjoying this kind of banquet. It's got various pots and vessels, and this is considered to be a banquet for her earthly souls. And her earthly souls are called the Po, and the, the souls of the material body, they carry the kind of inter, they carry the information that we need to keep our body functioning. So they know how to keep the body alive. They experience hunger and they experience thirst and they experience sexual desire. They know how to sort of procreate. They know how to keep the physical body going. And they're absolutely necessary to give us our kind of bodily wisdom, as it were. It's how the body knows how to, how to function, even without consciousness. And um, if these souls are not satisfied at death, then they might start to wander and become what are known as hungry ghosts. So it's really important that you feed these hungry souls after death. Otherwise, they'll wander either craving food or craving life itself or create or or possibly sexual desire and this is very much the sort of heart of the way ghosts are tend to be seen in most parts of the of east asia um they need to be given this food so that they are they're passive and they remain within the body and that they more or less are recycled with the body they don't want to go wandering you don't want them to sort of go go off wandering so it's quite common, um, this is also um, a passage from the Song of Chu, Songs of Chu, and this also in, in the grave, there, were also, there was also quite a lot of food there, actually, 
food that it, it almost remained intact after again when this this tomb was opened there was quite a lot of food and they could still tell what it was and this is um a part of the songs of chu called the recall of the soul and it says take rice millet wheat as well as yellow sorghum pastries honey and flatbreads as well as delicious cakes drinks the color of precious stones perfectly prepared filling the bird cups all this in readiness for a splendid banquet with drinks the color of agate so it was a very common um practice to provide food for the for the dead for the souls of the dead just at the side of this um plinths where the banquet is happening are these two creatures two on either side and it's a kind of tortoisey turtle type creature with an owl on the back and these are considered to be the creatures that are able to kind of go between the worlds so they're able to go between the world of the living and the kind of underworld as it were so these beings are there to help transport the soul into into the underworld And this is the lowest part of the banner. And the underworld in, I, I don't even really want to call it an underworld because it's not, there isn't so much in here, it's definitely underneath, but it's, it's not usually called the underworld. It's the place of watery darkness is how it's often referred to. It's usually considered to be in the north and it's often considered to be underwater. So it's a, it's a, it's not a place, the, the idea of an underworld in the Chinese tr this, uh, tradition at this time was that nothing to do with being a place of punishment. It was simply a place where the materiality of the, of the body, the materiality of everything, is able to regenerate. It's able to break down and be dissolved and be regenerated. And the images that go with this area of dark wateriness, as it were, are nearly always images of um, renewal and regeneration and fertility. It's very common that in the nor what's called the northern darkness that there's large fish and this is common in quite a few of the myths that these large fish are found and the fact that the fish are spotted and again possibly relating to a yin and yang fish not quite so clear with the color but very possibly and um, the dots are considered to represent this idea of the seeds of fertility and in supporting the platform standing on the fish is this being and again he's sort of almost an atlas like like figure holding up this platform but and there's quite a lot of speculation about who this figure actually is but um he's sometimes called a f a being called Xuan Ming who's literally the the dark obscurity and um, he's one of the guardians of this area of the north. He's also sometimes called a dark warrior, but I, it's unusual to see him in this sort of naked state. If you, if you see him as the dark warrior, he's usually very dark, but dressed in sort of a slight military type thing. So the two fish represent fertility and the red snake, which again is curling around the dragon tails, which are separating at this point in the painting. And the red snake is considered to be the power of regeneration, of sort of transformation and, and regeneration. There's always this idea of beings that shed their skins as being a kind of symbol of regeneration. There's also this interesting 
thing that we can see, particularly around the neck of the of the red snake, which is a black ribbon. And if we were to go a bit further above again, we could see the same thing on the turtle necks. They, they've sort of got these black ribbons almost binding them to something. And it's so um, often considered to be a kind of symbol that in this area, we're still in the area of life and regeneration. So there's not a freedom as there is in the upper part of the banner to kind of float free of the material existence, as it were. Here, there's very much a still tied to material existence, even though it's being broken down to be regenerated. And there are also these little spirit creatures again at the side of the fish. I think I've got a close-up of one of those. But um, it's very common to see um, the snake and the turtle or the tortoise as the symbols of the north and the symbols of regeneration, which relates in the sort of Chinese cosmological thinking with the watery element as well. And this is a close-up of one of these little... Again, it's like they're kind of playing, <laughs> the same way that they were playing on the um, the clouds or the, the sort of swirlings of qi on the, ca on the coffin casings. We see them in occasional places through this banner as if they're kind of playing. They're playing with the tails and the, and the serpents. Yeah, this is, again, this picture from the outside of the banner, which has them sort of literally sort of racing up and down. So if we come back to the centre, just um, directly below the knot, and here they're sort of almost like riding on this um, flow, it's difficult to know what to call it. It's almost like a veil coming out of the, of the central disc. Um, there are these two, what are generally considered to be bird men. Bir a bird man is quite a common um, term for an immortal. And it's sort of speculated that these two are possibly the ancestors of the representing the ancestors of the woman who died and possibly to act as guides to help her after after the death so directly above this we're going up possibly into the upper worlds having the material soul having been properly dealt with and regenerated, allowed to regenerate it in the lower worlds, we're then going to follow her heavenly souls into the upper world. So this is another plinth just above where the dragons came together. And directly above there are these two leopard creatures and Leopards are mentioned quite often, particularly in the Songs of Chu, as guarding the various gates on the way to the upper realms. And here we very clearly have a picture of the woman in the center, and behind her are three figures, which are sometimes called her attendants, but of, because of the three and the seven, they're very much related to the idea at this time in Chinese cosmological thinking that there were through three heavenly souls and seven earthly souls, which is what makes that sort of translation of these figures quite um, accurate, I think. And so here we have her three hun, her three um, heavenly souls. And in the same way that the, um, the Po was the sort of bodily intelligence in charge of the sort of mechanical um, functions of life, the Hun is considered to be really the consciousness, and it's the part that can travel in dreams, it can travel in meditation, and also in shamanic journeying. And the songs of Chu were considered to be 
a lot of the poems in the Songs of Chu were considered to be about this kind of shamanic journeying of the soul. So while the Hun and the Po are attached in this sort of binding that creates life, the Hun can go traveling and it will always return to the body. But once the two are separated, the Hun tend, has a tendency to kind of float away. So it needs to help. It needs help and it needs guidance in its travel up to heaven. And here on the left-hand side of the image, there are two figures, so these are considered to be two male figures, who um, you can usually just tell by the hairdos whether they're male or female. And these two male guides are possibly considered to be her teachers or her, possibly her, I think not her ancestors, maybe her teachers in this case. It, that's usually considered to be the fact that these are two teachers of hers who are going to help her on her journey. So directly above this plinth is the only area of the banner that's actually empty. And it's an idea of the void. It's the idea that she has to navigate this vast voidness in order to reach what's called the gate of heaven or the gate of the sort of land of the immortals, as it were. And the dragons here are kind of turning their backs on each other. They're no longer merged together. They're, they're turning their backs on each other and they're creating a space almost for the woman to, to be guided up to, to reach the gate of heaven. And the gate is guarded by a strange bird, a sort of owl-like creature almost. And in some of the legends, it's said that there's a four-winged bird that guards the gate of heaven. And this is possibly that. It's a rather strange-looking bird. It almost looks almost a bit more like a bat, but it... it it's usually considered to be this sort of four-winged bird that's talked about in some of the souls of Chu or some of the songs and, and legends. And above the bird, there's a red canopy. And the, it's very common that there's this idea that there's a canopy between heaven and earth. And a, a red canopy is it's usually described as a red canopy. And... Um, this is sometimes referred to as the lightning gate, which was the gate that we, we heard of in the earlier, in the earlier um, quote from the Song of Chu. So the heavenly canopy in Chinese, it's usually called a Tian Gai. And above that are two phoenixes and a strange sort of fleur de lis flower. And both the flower and the phoenixes, whereas we had the fish and the the fish and then the serpent and the and the turtle tortoise they're animals creatures of the darkness and the north um both the sort of flourishing flower and the phoenixes it's usually a red phoenix are symbols of the south and the light and of transformation and just above here we can see the beginnings of the gate in this in this slide at the top and just directly above that sitting on the gate are these two attendants, possibly guards, and again, two leopards. And um, the tigers and leopards are, cons are, again, considered to be guardians of these gates. And there's another little quote from the Songs of Chu, which says, there are tigers and leopards at the nine passes. By biting, they're an obstacle from people from down here. So they only allow through the right people, as it were. So now we're coming to the upper part of the banner. The upper part of the banner is considered to represent, I, I'm always a little bit, I don't want to call it heaven because it's not really heaven, but it's certainly the Im immaterial world. It kind of represents an immateriality in some way. Yin and Yang are no longer combining. There's two dragons still, and they're considered to be a yin dragon and a yang dragon, but they're not meeting each other. They don't twine, entwine with each other, so they're no longer interested in creating material life. And the most... Um, probably the most sort of immediately obvious things are the sun and the moon. The sun 
um, the red sun, which has a black crow in the centre, and um, a sliver of what's possibly a new moon. And um, again, the new moon would be a sort of symbol of rebirth and regeneration. So the symbol of the sun with a crow is, again, it's a very ancient symbol. And um, any kind of flying creature at this time would be considered to be a symbol of the yang. But um, it's this particular symbol is very old and it's found in some of the kind of oldest pottery shards that have been found, this symbol of the crow in the sun. And there's a very nice little quote from the Huainan to chapter 7, which is, in the sun there is a three-toed crow and in the moon there's a spotted toad. He's a little bit less clear because um, this is where the banner was probably most damaged in this corner. But if you can probably just about make out this toad figure crouching on the moon. And above the toad, again, even a little bit more difficult to, to make out, there's, a, there's the figure of a hare. And um, the hare is, again, very commonly associated with the moon, and it's usually shown in this kind, this is a kind of little embroidery of a hare in the moon, and he's pounding this elixir of immortality. The hare is nearly always shown with a kind of pestle and mortar, and he's pounding herbs to make um, the elixir of immortality. So below the sun, there's um, the Yang dragon, who's associated with the sun, and he's partly obscured by the kind of branches of a tree, which are kind of in, almost intertwined with the dragon. And the tree houses eight more suns. And this again is a very popular kind of myth and legend of the time. And this is a, a little quote from the Shanghai Jin, which is the, is the book of mountains and seas. On an elevation in the Valley of the Sun, there's a mulberry tree called Fu Sal. One sun arrives as another one leaves, and all of them are carried by a crow. And there's another legend which seems is maybe implied here, we're not sure, but there was um, one day, according to one legend, um, all the ten suns came out at once and the earth was burning up. And instead of this sort of cycle, they're supposed to sort of come one at a time in a daily order, but they all came out at once. And there was a, an archer called Yi, Yi the archer, the heavenly archer he's often called, and he shot down eight of these nine suns. I think there was altogether nine, not ten. He shot down eight of these nine suns, and um, the earth was sort of saved from disaster. So he was considered to be one of the ancient um, heroes in Chinese mythology. And interestingly, one version of the um, legend suggests that as a reward for shooting down these eight extra suns, he was given the drug of immortality. And... Uh, it was stolen by his wife. And some, I'm not sure, but some commentators say that it might be Yi the archer's wife who's shown here on the wing of the yin dragon. And she's on her way to the moon. But um, the legend also says that when she reached the moon, she was turned into the toad. So... <laughs> That's one version. There's lots of different versions of these. Of these, um, And I think I prefer to think of this figure as the woman herself, who is actually now riding on the dragon, the, the dragon's wing up to receive the, uh, the uh, gift of the elixir of immortality.
Yeah, there's a rabbit with a little, quite nice quote, which says, Mounting the flying dragon, I make my chariot of many precious stones. Driving the eight dragons that undulate, I carry my standard of clouds that coil in spirals. Here's another um, from the Songs of Chu. <clears throat> so finally, we come to this figure in the center of the upper part. It's this really beautiful image of, again, reminiscent of the um, figures of Fushi and Nu Gua, these sort of original immortal progenitors of the human race, as it were. Half human, half serpent. And this idea of being half human, half serpent is usually a, another one of the symbols of kind of immortality. And again, there's quite a lot been written about who this figure is. Is it Fushi? Is it Nu Gua? Again, I think there's, we can have many possible interpretations of it. And um, I think my preferred interpretation is definitely that it's the woman herself. And she's reached this sort of central state within herself of, of, of her sort of immortal being, as it were. And it's interesting because it's a very androgynous figure. I, I mentioned that um, very often in these sort of early paintings, you can tell which figure's a woman and which figure's a man by the hat or the hairdo. And here there's a very obvious, very deliberate use of the hair being very kind of let loose and at ease, which again is very much a kind of the way that certain Taoist priests might wear their hair at certain times. And um, there's also the idea that it's, it's very much a kind of union of the yin and yang within one being because she has the red transformation of the of the yang of the serpent tail, but also this very quiet meditative figure dressed in this sort of pale blue white, which is usually used to represent yin throughout throughout the uh, the banner. And she seems to be sitting quietly in meditation. Well, and again, just it reflected this very lovely um, chapter of the Tao Te Ching, which is, can you hold fast to your soul and not let it wander? Can you make your breath as soft as a newborn baby's? Can you wipe your dark mirror free of dust? Can you serve and govern without effort? Can you be the female at heaven's gate? Can you light up the world without knowledge? Can you beget things and keep things, but beget without possessing and keep without controlling? This is called dark virtue. And again, just a, I'm a reminder, it's another one of these lovely stone carvings of Fushi and Nu Gua. Just um, actually to go back to, we can see around this figure there are several cranes which are considered to be the birds of immortality, as it were. And there's four here very clearly looking upwards. They're just sort of looking up towards the heavens, as it were, or just looking upwards. And then we have two... who are diving downward. We can just see them here at the top of the image. And they're above this extraordinary device, as it were, that's right in the center of the upper part of the banner. And it's, um, it's held, it's quite difficult to see, but it's held by these two strings. And it's almost, um, it's almost like a kind of, um, I'm trying to think of the word, it's like a spinning top. And these two beings, who are again these kind of sprite beings, and here they're kind of on strange horsebacks, and they're kind of pulling these strings to keep things turning in the center. And there's a very beautiful um, quote from, again, from the Huynanza, chapter one of the Huynanza, very beautifully translated by Harold Roth, which is the two august ones of high antiquity, which again is referring to Fushi and Nu Gua, grasp the handles of the Tao, and so they were established in the center. Their spirits mysteriously wandered together with all transformations and thereby pacified the four directions. Hence they could revolve like heaven and stand still like earth, cycle round and round without stopping, 
flowing unceasingly like water, they ended and began together with all things. As winds arose and clouds formed, there was no event to which they did not respond. As thunder rumbled and rain descended, to all they responded without end. Ghosts departed and spirits entered, dragons arose and phoenixes alighted. Like the potter's wheel turning, like the wheel hub spinning, they circled round and round. So this image is very much like that of the potter's wheel spinning and the wheel turning, which is almost the idea that this is sort of keeping keeping the cosmos going, as it were. They're kind of these idea that these spirits grasp the handles of the Tao and keep and keep things moving. And just to conclude, there's a, again a very beautiful um, quote in the Tao Te Ching, chapter twenty-five. There are things chaotic yet complete, before heaven and earth were formed, quiet, deserted, silent and solitary, standing alone and unchanging, extending everywhere but unscathed. Maybe this is the mother of all under heaven. I don't know its name, but let's call it Tao. Thank you.